Thank you for downloading this podcast from Digital Mindfulness. I'm Lawrence Ampofo, and this is session number 18. Hello and welcome to the Digital Mindfulness Podcast, where every week we talk with experts from around the world on ways that people and organisations can enhance their relationships with digital technologies and digitised societies. In this episode, I speak with the psychiatrist Dr Judson Brewer, who's the Director of Research at the Centre for Mindfulness and is also Associate Professor at the Department of Medicine and Psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Brewer is an internationally recognized leader in mindfulness training, and he's also developed mindfulness programs for the treatment of addictions, including app-based treatments. In this interview, we talk about Dr. Brewer's work on the underlying mechanisms of mindfulness, using fMRI to image the brain on mindfulness, and also the psychology and physiology of flow. This is an absolutely captivating interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Judson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So just for people that don't know very much about about your work, I was wondering if you can just share a little bit of your backstory. What was your journey to working on mindfulness? And I'm excited to know a little bit more about um, your first work, or your first research, because you've really done some groundbreaking research in the past and right now with Flow. The short version is that I came to mindfulness through just being stressed out. You know, I'd gone through a bad relationship breakup right before starting medical school and started meditating, uh, listening to John Kabat-Zinn's cassette tapes uh, back in the mid 90s. Uh, while I was going through medical school and and, um, studying for my PhD in immunology. And so just practicing personally for about 10 years before I shifted my entire research career from molecular biology and immunology to neuroscience, clinical trials, and mindfulness. Uh, In particular, I was very interested in addictions because my patients with addictions, I'm an addiction psychiatrist, my patients were speaking the same language as the Buddhist psychologist had spoken 2,500 years ago. They were talking about craving and clinging and wanting and kind of being sucked along by their um, their addictions. And so that, that got me really interested to see how we could actually use mindfulness to help people with addictions. Mm-hmm. So when you first began to um, do work, clinical work with this, could you see the correlation between conducting mind- a mindfulness practice and addiction or the alleviation of addictive behavior? No, it was, it was really clear right from the beginning. Um, you know, just the way that people would talk about their addictions, whether it was alcohol or cocaine or, or nicotine, you know, when they were addicted to cigarettes, um, and just seeing, just hearing their stories, having, having them talk about how they were enchanted by these things, you know, especially with smoking where people say, oh yeah, you know, smoking is my best friend. And then we really would dive into it. And, you know, mindfulness is really just about seeing clearly what you're doing. And so we would actually have them smoke, which was a big paradox for them because they would, they, you know, they thought this was smoking cessation work. And we'd have them smoke and they would just pay attention when they smoked and they got these epiphanies where they, you know, they said, wow, this doesn't actually, this isn't actually as great as I thought it was, and, which is the first you know, one of the first pieces that mindfulness helps with is helps people see clearly what they're getting so they become less enchanted, less pulled along by their habitual behaviors. So, well, I, am, I really am looking forward to going into this, but let's take a step back. And just for people that don't know or that don't have so 
um, firm of a grasp on this. What does mindfulness actually mean? Because there are lots of definitions of it in, I guess, the spiritual, religious, and also medical literature. There are lots of definitions, and I won't pretend to have the, you know, the best one. But one way that I like to think about it is, you know, if you use John Kabat-Zinn's standard definition of paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, you know, that can be um, that can be a mouthful for some folks. So if you take that and you just think of it, the paying attention, where you're paying attention to what's going on right now, but bringing an attitude of curiosity, of of kindness, of non-judgment. So seeing if there's a push or pull in our own experience, seeing if there's a, a there's a pull toward holding on to things that are pleasant and a push towards getting rid of things that are unpleasant. That's what, you know, I think operationally what mindfulness is about. And and you kind of very you very briefly touched on it, but what are some of the findings of the effects that it has on people? Obviously, you've done a lot of work with um, addictions, um, but yeah, I'm just really interested to know how this works from a clinical perspective. Well, there's growing evidence in a number of different fields, and again, you know, most of my expertise is in addictions. Uh, I think there's some really strong evidence with depression, for example. Um, the folks in the UK are finding really nice results with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, as well as in, in Canada and in the US as well, um, showing that it can help people with depression not uh, get depressed again, so help prevent relapse to depressive episodes, helps with anxiety. Uh, we found that it can actually double um, quit rates for smoking, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, if you get twice the quit rate just by paying attention to, to your smoking habits and learning how to ride out your cravings, that's pretty remarkable. Um, it's incredible how mindfulness is a non-invasive um, technique or intervention and that it has these incredible um, success rates with, with patients that have very serious um, ailments. Yeah, it is pretty remarkable. And I think if you look mechanistically at what's going on, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, at least it does to me. So we've been studying the psychological mechanisms in terms of, you know, what's, how is mindfulness actually helping people change their behavior, whether it helps them uh, keep from getting sucked into a ruminative thought pattern if they're depressed or helps them from getting sucked into a craving if they're uh, addicted to cigarettes. And when you look at it, and you look at what's going on, you see that it helps with some very basic fundamental uh, learning processes that have been known for a long time, such as operant conditioning or positive and negative reinforcement. And if people are positively reinforced uh, through or negatively reinforced for behaviors, for example, if you smoke when you're stressed out, that perpetuates the smoking. It seems that mindfulness directly interacts right in those pathways where it helps people see what the craving is and decouple it from that urge to behave. And in that sense, it breaks these fundamental operant conditioning loops. So it may seem, you know, almost magical, but the truth is there's a lot of biology behind this and, and we're finding, you know, that it, that it interacts directly with these pathways. And this is interesting talking about the biology with this because you've actually done a lot of work in terms of mapping the brains of people that are actively conducting mindfulness meditation. Yes, that's been so. That was our next step. Once we saw that, you know, mindfulness actually had some real clinical effects in our hands. We wanted to see what was going on in the brain. And some of our first studies were taking experience of novice meditators and having them meditate in our fMRI scanner so we could measure their brain activity. Uh, while they were meditating, or at least a surrogate marker of their brain activity. And we found that w across a number of different types of meditation, that experienced meditators' brains were behaving very differently than novice meditators. Not only were they deactivating certain parts of their brains that are typically overactivated when people are craving or otherwise getting caught up in their experience, but their network connectivity, so their their uh, typical networks of brain regions that talk to each other were talking in a different way than uh, normal, whatever normal people are, than, uh, than the general population. Because, um, yeah, yeah, and like in, in, a, in a lot of your work, you've spoken of this, you call it the um, default mode network or the default state of the brain. 
Yes, yeah. So the default mode network was discovered probably about 15 years ago by Mark Rakel's group at Washington University. Actually, while I was there during my uh, doing my PhD, and what it, you know, in a nutshell, it's basically this brain region that or this brain network that seems to be activated when we are uh, doing self-referential processing. So when we're thinking about ourselves or thinking about how something relates to us. And you can even dive in a little deeper. We've done some neurophenomenological work where we can link subjective experience to brain activity and have found that this brain region seems to get activated in particular when uh, we get caught up in experience. So when we're resisting something and we're caught up in resisting or when we're craving something or trying to hold on to something and caught up in that. Uh, And this um, one part of the brain uh, called the posterior cingulate cortex, one of the hubs of the default mode network, it gets activated during these things and then gets deactivated when we let go. And what is meditation about? It's about letting go. Uh, so we see it especially deactivated when people are really letting go or getting out of their own way. Oh, so that's what you mean by getting out of your own way. Because um, a lot of people um, that I've spoken to about this, they would, they've said to me that... Um, being in, um, I don't know, like daydreaming, for example, is mm-hmm. perhaps the epitome of being in a flow state, purely because I think um, there are lots of very famous people who have daydreamed and have, um, I don't know, they've come across great insights, like, I don't like Darwin or Einstein or whatever, you know, they would go on their walks and they would daydream and then that's when they would come along across their great insights. But is this um, state of daydreaming, is that very similar to being in the default mode network? I would say that it is, and there are good data showing that when you're daydreaming or when you're mind wandering, the default mode network is activated. Mm. But I wouldn't say that that's actually flow, because that's the opposite of what we see. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, for example, um, you know, if you ask Michael Jordan when he's on the basketball court just totally dunking on everybody is he daydreaming probably not (laughs) (laughs) if you ask these extreme sports people who are you know skiing down these wicked steep um slopes i'm gonna guess they're not daydreaming because if they daydream they're dead Mm. and with and like i said and with this um with the default mode network this is um this is the antithesis this is the opposite to um being in a mindful state of mind you were talking about letting go and i think it's really interesting how you um how you said we when we are in the default mode network we either crave something or we're resisting something it's almost like we're in a state of um um hyperbole you know it's always the extremes that we that our mind is reaching for whereas actually when we're in that mindful state of mind um it's kind of bang in the middle we're letting all of that go and it sounds it sounds like a more restful state for the mind to be in yeah i would say it's well experientially certainly it's it's just delicious um i don't know how else to describe it right because it's very restful it's completely effortless and you know we're completely out of our own way so it's absolutely restful but at the same time just um very lucid I would say and in that sense again very different than daydreaming where we're you know we're lost um, and we wake up from that dream Uh, so absolutely very very restful so when when people I guess when you've used the fMRI scanner to map people's minds um, sorry brains whilst they're uh, meditating have people been able to influence how their brain works once they can see their output on screen yeah we found that so experienced meditators uh at least with the one brain region that we've looked at because there are many others but we've only really scrutinized one using real-time neurofeedback while people are in an fmri scanner or or using an eeg source estimated neurofeedback setup Uh, experienced meditators are pretty good at deactivating this brain region and we've even found that Uh, novice meditators have usually accidentally kind of tripped into being able to control their brain in in very short order. So we've had several novice meditators 
whose brains look pretty, you know, this brain region looks pretty activated or pretty scattered. And then, um, you know, boom, you know, nine minutes later, they trip into um, a, a experience where their, their brain is showing that this region, this posterior cingulate cortex is deactivated pretty consistently. And we've had them report things like, oh, well, I noticed when I stop uh, trying to, you know, to do this, then it's actually easier, just like within flow. Because when I am trying, I am doing something, and flow is not about me. It's about me just getting out of my own way and letting my brain uh, do its thing. So certainly, um, we've we've seen this both with uh, ex- mostly with experience, but even occasionally with novice meditators, which has actually given us the idea to start uh, playing with if we can use this as a way to give people a mental mirror around linking up their subjective experience of what it actually feels like to get caught up and let go because often we mistake excitement for happiness and excitement's a very caught up state how do you mean could you could you just elaborate a bit on that because i think sure you're so right well if you think about so just think about your own experience if you're totally excited you're leaning in because you want more it's like that you know oh let me get on that roller coaster one more time yeah. um whereas you know, at least it, from a meditative sense or a mindful sense there's an easeful restful even curious um state of mind when when we're when we're in flow for example we're not trying to get anywhere and we're not leaning into anything because there's no us to lean and so it's a very open wide expansive experience whereas if you think of excitement it's very contracted and it has a quality of restlessness even which you know it's funny because that's often (laughs) how my my um my patients with cocaine addictions describe you know when they're about to smoke crack or something like that um, so going back to our conversation about um, um, addiction, um, is technology then for you, our digital technologies, are they addictive? Do they have the same addictive qualities um, as, say, you know, cigarettes, alcohol? Well, yeah, I think they certainly can, and they're even set up that way. So if you set your email on your computer to bang every time you get an email, you're going to get intermittent reinforcement, which is the most addictive type of reinforcement learning. It's the same type they use in casinos and the same type that rat researchers use to get rats addicted to certain, you know, things. So, you know, the same thing happens with our phones even more so because you never know when you're going to get a text or a tweet or an email. And so that when your phone is constantly or intermittently binging and buzzing, then that Uh, conditions us to start picking up our phones all the time and worse than that because they've done that and we can now get um internet you know we can look surf the web with our phones Mm. anytime we're we're bored or restless or unhappy we have this little you know this crack box you know one of my friends used to call it (laughs) crackberry yeah um, we have this little thing that we can pull out of our pocket anytime we want to sati- to soothe us by distracting ourselves from our own, you know, our own emotions. So it, they can be tremendously addictive if we don't have control over our minds. Have you done much work with that in terms of um, in the addiction of technology? Not yet, but we are hoping. So we, you know, ironically or paradoxically probably more ironically, we've developed a uh, smoking cessation program uh, called Craving to Quit, where we actually take all of the in-person training, uh, of mindfulness training that we've found is very useful in helping people quit smoking and use deliver it through people's phones, through videos and animations and things like that. And so we can actually take this technology that's driving people you know, to distraction and use it as a way to help train them, um, train their minds. So that's our first, you know, that's our first foray into this. And the hope is that we can eventually develop the same type of tools because the training's the same. Mm-hmm. It's just a different object. We can use the same type of tools to train people to get control over their addiction to technology. You know, one of the I would love to see, you know, in the U.S. at least, playground accidents are going up, uh, or have uh, over the last couple of years because 
um, parents aren't paying attention to their children anymore because they're addicted to looking at their phones while their kids – they're supposed to be watching their kids on the playground. That is fascinating. Yeah, so it would be great if we could help that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I also kind of I've listened to um, um, your talks online and, and I know that one of the other things that you're working on is an app for um, for food, um, for food addiction, because you're yes. talking about how how addictive um, our foods are as well. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, this pathway that we've been studying, this positive and negative reinforcement from what we can under, what from what we understand seems to be have been set up so that we would remember where food is. So it's helpful to remember what food is not poisonous, what food is good, you know, it gives you calories and also where to find it. Mm. Uh, and this pathway, you know, is still intact in modern day except there's a abundance of food, so we don't need it, you know, as much. So we use it for other things. Uh, so the pathways are the same, whether it's smoking or emotional eating. And it seems that a, a lot of people have, you know, they gain weight or have trouble losing weight or just get addicted to sugar because sugar releases the same dopamine in your brain that smoking crack or smoking cigarettes does. And in the same sense, because these pathways are the same, we can use mindfulness to target, you know, directly target the pathway so we can help people start to learn when they are have an urge to eat and differentiate that urge from actual physiologic hunger. Mm -hmm. We can also teach them to pay attention to the type of food they reach for and what their what the consequences are when they eat, you know, sugary food versus food that is higher in protein and, you know, lower in, in processed sugar, for example. And we can also teach people to um, pay attention in how they eat. So they they move, you know, I have a great example. We've been piloting this in my clinic. Um, I have somebody who used to binge eat, you know, most of the month and she would eat an entire pizza and feel guilty about it afterwards. She's now moved to being able to eat a single slice of pizza and actually enjoy it. What a concept, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Crazy, huh? Just through paying attention. Uh, it's, it's really transformed her life. and It's just beautiful to see these transformations happen. So we can deliver all of that training now you know, in, in, you know, in, in a way through apps and through online communities in a way that's sustainable. You know, this is, I love this conversation and I, and I really like what you're saying here because it's, it's so empowering and it's – and again, I know I've said it before, but it's a non-pharmaceutical intervention, which is mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. And what this really tells me is that as human beings, we have so much more power over our mental, emotional and physical state than, than we thought. You know, we just, it's almost like we haven't had the edge, like you keep saying, teaching, 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 you know, and that the technology is just a tool for you to teach and for, you know, kind of community support to help um, um, to help people on their journeys and it just sounds like we haven't had the right education in terms like emotional and um, um, I guess mental um, education to um, to support our states. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're starting to see a movement now even in schools uh, for teaching mindfulness in schools and, you know, teaching people emotional intelligence, which is has a lot of overlap with mindfulness training, you know, pe teaching people to pay attention. Um, so it's pretty funny because in schools now, they're finally teaching kids to pay attention, <laughs> 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 which is just so funny. <laughs> it seems like they've always been like kind of on us to pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. But now they're teaching us to. <laughs> right. Right. And well, and that's the that's the thing is you can't force yourself to pay attention. Right. You can do it only for so long until you get tired and then your brain says, I'm bored. I'm going to do something else. Mm. Well, if you bring in this this concept and you foster curiosity, mm. curiosity naturally draws you in. And so if you're naturally drawn in, you don't have to force yourself to pay attention at all. And that's exactly what we've even seen in the fMRI scanner when people are curious and they get interested their posterior, you know, their default mode network gets really quiet because they don't, they're not thinking about something there else. They're not lost. They're not caught up. They're just totally in the moment. So yeah, it, it's it's so funny that we're now getting back to actually how 
how to teach people to pay attention, which has been around for thousands of years. That is incredible. So, um, I mean, what are some of the, um, I guess, some of the clinical findings? Like what actually happens once you can learn to cultivate that quality of mind? Well, I think it can affect anything that uh, taps into these positive and negative reinforcement loops. So as I think I mentioned before with depression, you know, one of the problems with depression is rumination where people are just constantly getting sucked into these negative uh, thought patterns. And so if you can notice your negative thought pattern, notice that it doesn't help anything and all it does is perpetuate a negative self view, then you can learn to let go of it. Uh, that's just one example. Same for anxiety. When people are caught up in anxious thoughts or worries, they can learn to just notice these as thoughts and realize, oh, I, I'm actually being driven by just some concept in my mind, some thought. And if I just notice it, you know, kind of like a bubble, it can just pop on its own and, or I'm not dragged along by it. Uh, same for, you know, addictions and other types of things. I know you haven't done um, much um clinical research in this but I'm thinking just in the realm of say online communications if if you were able to um, spot different patterns that led to say conflict online with regards to say I don't know cyberbullying or, or whatever um, if you were to if you were able to have the aware to cultivate the awareness to spot that then perhaps your time online would be would be better you'd feel better or if you notice that actually when you did reach for your phone that there was a particular psychological pattern that was driving that and actually you weren't enjoying it much like your, your former patient with the pizza, um, then perhaps we'd have a better relationship with um, our digital devices. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a great um, short Louis C.K. clip. I think he was interviewed by Conan O'Brien where he talks about kids being mean these days through their phones and, you're, and they can text to each other. They can say, oh, you're fat. And, um, and it's, he's like, oh, and that feels good because they're not actually getting the negative reinforcement by seeing the other kid's reaction to their behavior. So they're they're flipping what would normally be a socially appropriate response which is the other you see the other kid get sad you get negatively reinforced to do that so you you don't bully them when suddenly you can just think ha 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 i'm going to say something mean and not see the negative consequences of it until you know it escalates out of control um, leading on now from our discussion about mindfulness, and we've just literally talked about this concept very briefly, but um, you've also done a great deal of research on the concepts of flow. Um, and just for our audience, could you just say what flow actually is and what your, what your research has shown you in this? Because um, this is absolutely fascinating. Well, we kind of tripped into this, uh, so not, not on purpose, but I would say I think Chicksun Mahai's definition of flow includes the quality of, you know, qualities of being selfless, of being timeless, of being effortless. Um, and he even describes conditions that support getting into flow. So, for example, picking a task that's just above your, your ability level but not too hard because if it's too easy, then you're going to get bored and your mind's going to wander. And if it's too hard, you might get frustrated if you're not able to do it. So you pick something that just makes you, makes you stretch a little bit mentally, and then you can pop into flow. We've been – so there's a lot of overlap, especially with regard to the selfless and timeless elements between flow and mindfulness. Because you know mindfulness and many meditative techniques train people to notice this – the um, – you know, the illusory nature of self, if you want to think of it that way, this dualistic perspective that we habitually um, take. And whenever we're holding a dualistic perspective, we can't be in flow we're, because we're creating a boundary between ourselves and other. So we've been studying this from the meditation side, just looking to see, you know, what the neural mechanisms are related to um, holding a, a, a self or approaching a, something from a selfish perspective or a self-centered perspective and really letting go and getting into flow. And this is where it comes back to the default mode network because with, you know, and, and again, just as a potential marker of this boundary between um, flow and, and self, the 
getting caught up in experience may be a, an actual experiential marker of a dualistic perspective because when you get caught up in something, there's an experience of a boundary. You know, there, there's a collapsing down into or a congealing of, you know, if you want to call it the experiential self. Whereas when we are completely out of our own way, those boundaries collapse. And, you know, if those boundaries go to infinity, that, that may be a good way of thinking experientially of what flow is because there's no you doing anything. There's just stuff happening and awareness of stuff happening often involving awe because it's amazing when, when we are in flow. It's, it, this is amazing because, um, you know, having been an, having been an athlete myself, um, I've experienced flow and, and it's the most incredible feeling particularly when you're aware that you are in this state um, but yeah. of course as soon as you become as soon as i became aware of it it went <laughs> immediately yeah, yeah. right yeah we've even seen that with experienced meditators when they're getting the neural feedback and they see and they look at the graph and like oh wow i'm doing really well bam <laughs> <laughs> damn it <laughs> and um but i but I, I loved your analogy just then that you said you fell into flow and I feel that that's very much something that I experience when mm. I get into flow. I fall into it, you know, just kind of. Yeah, you can't into, force flow, right? And whenever I do speak to you know colleagues or friends, they you know when we talk about this, they very much say that they fall into it. But but from what you're saying, that we if you kind of develop a deliberate um, mindfulness practice, that you can actually cultivate flow. Yeah, absolutely. You can start to see what the conditions are that create a separation or a dualistic or a, basically getting caught up in your experience. And the more you can notice your, when you're caught up, you can notice how painful it is to be caught up. And when you notice how painful it is, you're more likely to let go. And when you let go, you're moving in the direction of flow. And it's just a matter of how deep do you get. I, I really see this as a continuum more than a binary. Sometimes it can really feel when it gets really strong, it can feel like you've popped into it. Yeah. Um, but I would say we're always on a continuum of being caught up or letting go. And the more we let go, the more we're in flow. And then, of course, I mean, I've got a question here now, but I think I'm probably going to answer it myself. And I was going to ask what effects does a regular mindfulness practice and flow practice have on addictive um, behaviors? But I'm thinking now that when you do this regularly, you start to unravel everything that you think is yourself. So again, with this binge eating thing, you know, you actually understand what the um, precursors are to that and you can let it go or unravel it. If, if, you know, if you kind of have that kind of analytical mind, you can see where it's coming from and say, okay, that's fine. You stay over there. I don't need you. Um, and it just seems that you kind of unravel this self that you think you are and kind of go into something into something more in yeah into something more which is life I it, absolutely absolutely and when the training when people get very strong in the training they don't even need to say you stay over there because there's no over there versus here oh, wow that that is amazing and, and we talked very briefly in the pre-interview but it is just amazing how science is actually now it has caught up to a lot of what the contemporary and ancient mystics were saying and indeed almost like blazing a trail in terms of how we can achieve these mental um, states in order to you know in order to create a good life yeah those guys nailed it 2500 years ago without computers or torturing animals or anything uh, and <laughs> we're, we're slowly catching up Okay, so um, I guess this is my, my um, um, kind of penultimate question, but um, we've been talking about um, achieving these amazing states of mind, and you were saying, Judson, that you've developed some apps um, to help people do that, but um, if you, I was just wondering if you can say a little bit more clearly, how can people achieve these higher mental states and decrease some of what they might think to be their addictive digital behaviors? I would say that ex experientially the first thing that I would suggest that people do pragmatically is just to really pay attention to what it feels like when they're in some type of an addictive state. So if they're craving ice cream or craving a cigarette 
or you know craving some you know checking the internet when they are restless or bored to just really pay attention to what they get from that behavior that's the beginning of the end of becoming disenchanted with whatever it is and then when they can notice it and start to really see what they get from it and start to become disenchanted then they start to wonder well what is there anything better than this and they can start to see that you know oh these are actually just physical sensations that are driving me to act. So a craving is made up of restlessness, of tightness, of burning, of you know a bunch of different physical sensations that people have. And if you get curious about those physical sensations, you can realize, oh, these are these, these are just physical sensations. I don't actually have to act on them. And suddenly, we have much more control over our lives. So that's kind of you know middle stage where we can train ourselves, and then eventually. As we let go more and more and more, it just kind of unfolds on its own. And I guess then from there, you can actually start to identify the things that do benefit your life. So, for example, yeah. I don't know, going, for, going to the gym or spending time with people you need to spend time with. Um, right. Or, or even just actually listening when somebody's talking. Yes. It's much more... It's so much nicer to just actually be there when you're in a conversation as compared to, you know, being pulled by a thought about this or that. It's, you know, just being here doing whatever we're doing is plenty when we know how to do that. And I, you're absolutely right. And I guess if you can teach this to children very early on to um, pay attention to kind of develop more emotional and emotional and mental control then that does make them better to be around and that does it develop things like compassion and empathy and um just makes them um, um i don't know, I, I don't want to say more productive members of society but it just makes them better able to relate to society yeah and i i would say that children often have the characteristics that we need to re-foster in, in adults. So for example, children are naturally curious. And so if we can just uh, foster and, and uh, support that natural curiosity that somehow gets lost in adolescence and adulthood, that's great. And children are pretty good, you know, before they learn to get distracted, <laughs> they're pretty good at paying attention to when they've hurt other children or done other things and are naturally moved through negative reinforcement to not do those things. So if we can just foster those natural capacities of, you know, curiosity and wonder, then I think, you know, we don't unlearn. I, you know, it's almost like we're, as we become adults, we unlearn these good, good habits and we start learning bad ones because we are all worried about ourselves as we, do, as we differentiate into individuals. Fantastic. Um, Judson, that seems like a great place to leave it, leave it now. Um, where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, they can go to the they can go to the Center for Mindfulness's website at the UMass Medical School. Uh, that's where all of my research, uh, you know, we our publications and and whatnot are are um, are linked. There's also if they want to learn about our apps, um, there's uh, the company is called Claritas Mind Sciences. Uh, and the the smoking app is called Craving to Quit, so they can just go to cravingtoquit.com to see what that looks like. Um, and also, Anderson Cooper recently did a 60 minutes uh, piece on some of the meditation work and some of the neurofeedback work that we've been playing with, um, so they can look on you know probably search YouTube or whatnot for Anderson Cooper. Or even look at the you know I gave a TEDx talk a couple of years ago on uh, on. I think it was called You're Already Awesome, Just Get Out of Your Own Way. So those are a couple of uh, resources that people can look at uh, just to get more of an idea of what we're up to. Fantastic. And I will absolutely link to everything that we've mentioned on the show notes Great. as well. Dr. Judson Brewer, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your wisdom with us. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I'm sure everybody else has. And yeah, thank you again for your time. Oh, my pleasure. That was Judson Brewer. His was such a compelling look at how a regular mindfulness practice can help bring our emotions and the relationships with our digital devices under some kind of control. I was especially interested in the ways that we can cultivate flow because 
as I mentioned in the interview, I thought the flow was something that people just fell into. Links to everything that we've spoken about in the show will be attached in the show notes and you can find those at digitalmindfulness.net. Tune in next week for more amazing, inspiring and actionable content just like this and have a great day.